Thank you for joining the DBRS Morning Star Great Webinar Series on the Canadian Telecom Industry. My name is Vikas Manjal, and I'll be moderating the discussions today. I work as an analyst on the consumer products, merchandising, and telecom communications team here at DBRS Morning Star, and I work with our senior vice president, Scott Rati, in the TMT sector. Scott is the lead analyst on all the Canadian telecom issues that are covered by TBS Monixia, including the Canada's largest telecom companies, Bell, Rogers, and Telus. The format this afternoon is a 30 minutes presentation followed by a Q&A session. Please remember to submit any questions to our speaker at any time using the Ask a Question tab below, and this will be addressed at the conclusion of the presentation. Please also note that this presentation today will be recorded. I will now turn it over to Scott to kickstart the presentation. Thanks very much, Vikas, and welcome once again to our Canadian Telecom webinar. As you can see from our agenda, we have a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. Here are our current public ratings. At a high level, the DBRS Morningstar's industry risk assessment for the Canadian telco industry is triple B stable. And looking at our credit universe, there are a couple things to note. First of all, the telcos with national wireless footprints are investment grade. Uh, second, Rogers and Shaw have been under review since the proposed merger was announced on March 15th earlier this year. And so their under review status is company specific. Uh, third is that TELUS is rated triple B high but was put on negative trend in mid-August of this year, owing to a higher than expected debt balance post the 3500 spectrum auction, a longer delevering period, and little operating slack in order to hit leverage targets. And finally, Kojiko, through its Canadian subsidiary Kojiko Connection, currently only offers wireline services in suburban Ontario and Quebec and is not investment grade rating. Now, let's take a look at some of the key drivers. As we stand in the last quarter of 2021, we see some key metrics in the industry come under pressure over the last one to two years. However, we believe that the softening leverage and ROIC metrics are transitional and largely necessary to support long-term growth in the industry. Further, we see solid mobile-driven industry fundamentals, such as penetration rates, billing, churn, and also CapEx, supporting our investment-grade stable view on the industry. So while we recognize near-term softness in some of the credit metrics, we think the fundamental drivers of the industry in a facilities-based competitive environment support steady long-term growth. As a result, we don't anticipate a structural decline in the credit rating of the industry. The first industry credit metric we'll look at is leverage. As you can see, the gross dollar value of debt has been on an upward trend. However, as a result of solid EBITDA growth, leverage has been maintained at or slightly below three times on an annualized basis through about 2019. However, in 2020 and 2021, leverage has been ticking up relatively largely due to a combination of acquisition activity, spectrum license purchases, and COVID-related EBITDA pressure. As we stand today with the third quarter results behind us, it looks like the EBITDA growth is gaining momentum, and we expect the industry to deliver low to mid-single-digit EBITDA growth in 2021 and mid-single-digit growth in 2022. On the debt side, as you can see from the chart, absolute debt levels are not expected to decline. But we do not expect delevering, or but we do expect delevering through EBITDA growth beginning in 2022. Now, a couple things to note on the forecast period on the debt side. First of all, obviously, it excludes Rogers, the Rogers and Shaw proposed merger. As we are trying to see the industry in this case in a steady state, and we look to evaluate unique or one-time events separately, and we'll get to those later in the presentation. The debt does include, though financing for the 3,800 megahertz spectrum in 2023, and an assumption of financing for millimeter wave in 2024. The bottom line from this graph is that the company-specific events may increase debt levels, but we view the baseline industry leverage to begin to moderate 
in 2022. Now let's take a look at ROIC. ROIC has trended down over the last couple years, primarily because of the industry continues to invest heavily in the network, acquiring spectrum, and in some cases, also businesses. We anticipate ROIC to stabilize in the 2021 to 2022 period, but remain below the levels posted in 2016 to 2019. However, there are several factors to consider with regard to ROIC from a credit perspective. The network investment that has occurred has produced highly reliable and world-class performing networks. Second, the spectrum spending is critical to the long-term success of the industry, and so returns are judged over a longer time horizon, i.e. in the five to 10 year time frame. Number three, spectrum itself is a non-depreciating asset and is likely to be far more valuable in the future than it is today. And finally, network investment provides a long-term tailwind for margins, basically as the fiber optic network costs less to maintain and operate. So the bottom line here with respect to ROIC is that DBRS Morningstar can accept periods of lower ROIC as the industry transitions to 5G. Further, given the lumpy nature of telecom spectrum investment, we anticipate a lag on capital returns that may stretch into the five to 10 year period. Now, when we consider future returns, we view mobile as a key driver over our forecast horizon. On this front, mobile penetration continues to provide a tailwind to the industry. As per the chart, there are two main things to note here. First, we see the mobile penetration rate rising from about 83% in 2015 to 91% in 2019, and smartphone penetration rising faster from about 61% in 2015 to about 82% in 2019. So despite LTE and 4G being available to 99.5% of the Canadian population aged 18 and older as per the CRTC's most recent communications report, we note that overall mobile penetration is only at about 91%, with wireless data subscriptions penetration only about 82%. Now to put this in context, despite the growth in Canada's total mobile penetration in the low 90% range, we are still behind the OECD average of 37 countries at about 118%. So this suggests there remains good runway for continued mobile subscriber growth in Canada. And we can see from the net ad activity that the national carriers are capitalizing on the trend of increasing mobile penetration. While we can see from the chart the pronounced seasonality through the year, we also see that the low penetration rates are helping drive roughly about 75 to 100,000 net mobile additions per quarter on average per national carrier. Importantly, we are also seeing the recovery of net ads post-COVID. In aggregate, across the industry, third quarter 2021 was not only a third quarter record in terms of net phone ads, but also a record for any quarter of the last five years. And while we are encouraged by the overall phone net phone ad numbers, management commentary pretty much across the board also suggested that the drivers of total net mobile additions were pretty broad-based across consumers, businesses, and also IoT loading. As the networks and applications continue to develop, we expect to see strong mobile loading continue, but still anchored by mobile phones over our forecast horizon. Moving along, in terms of mobile converting subscribers to revenue, we look at average billing per user, or ABPU, which reflects both equipment and also the service revenues. Now, prior to COVID, average billings were trending up modestly positive at about a four-year CAGR of 1.7% until 2020. From the chart, you can see that average billing softened through COVID, but appears to have stabilized as of the third quarter of this year. However, while average billing appears to have stabilized, there are sort of two different stories going on here. One is the equipment side is trending positively, and the service side um, has been softening, but starting to recover. First, on the equipment side, there are a few key drivers of the positive trend. Number one, the introduction of equipment installment plans, or EIPs, otherwise known as zero down plans, where you pay the price of the phone over 24 months, 
with 0% interest have become very popular as subscribers play nothing except the tax and make higher prices higher priced devices more accessible and the carrier does not need to provide a subsidy on the handset. There's also the fact that there's increasing handset prices. For example, the new iPhone 13 Pro Max retails at about $1,600 and is one of the most popular devices available. And finally, there's the 5G upgrade cycle, which is occurring over the next two to three years as subscribers look to upgrade their handsets. The other half of the average billing equation is service revenue, or ARPU, which has been under pressure for the last 24 months, primarily from two factors, the introduction of unlimited plans and COVID restrictions. Obviously, we view the COVID impact as temporary. Lockdown restrictions severely curtailed physical mobility, thereby impacting mobile usage, which hurt roaming and overage fees. However, Q3 results suggest the industry is moving past the trough in this regard. The more important structural factor was the 2019 introduction of unlimited plans by all four national wireless carriers. While these plans reduce overage fees, which were roughly about 4% of industry fees in 2019, now represent an estimated sort of 1%, uh, they put the pressure on service revenue. However, there are several reasons we view them as positively for the industry in the long term. First, the entry-level unlimited plan of $80 is still above the average estimated revenue per user of $55 bucks for the big three. Uh, the unlimited plans limit bill shock, which is the number one CCST complaint. It stimulates demand for higher data. There's less reliance on volatile overage fees. It aligns with the regulators, and perhaps most importantly, they lower churn which DBRS Morningstar views as a key metric in the valuation of the industry. Unlimited plans were launched by the national carriers in the second quarter of 2019, first with Freedom and then followed fairly quickly by the big three by about mid-June. This graph shows quarterly churn from the first quarter of 2019 to the most recent quarter where the data is, uh, continuous data is available. However, we, if we look at the first full quarter on, a, on a unlimited plan availability until now, i.e. the third quarter of 2019 to the third quarter of 2021, churn is down an average of nine basis points, with the decline ranging from about five basis points to 15 basis points, depending on the carrier. We recognize it's hard to pinpoint the impact of different factors on churn, i.e. things like the unlimited plans, but also ongoing COVID influence or bundling. But based on the data and management comments, we think unlimited plans are having a positive impact on churn. From there, we see two main implications of declining churn. First, obviously, is that the consumer satisfaction is improving, which according to CCTS data is in fact occurring as wireless complaints were down about 19.5% year over year in the last reported quarter or in the last reported period. The second is margin performance, which in a subscription business reflects the cost to replace those who have left. So we view the industry-wide adoption of unlimited plans as being an important contributing factor to the declining trend in churn. And, <clears throat> and while it reduces overage fees, it should provide long-term margin support and enhance customer satisfaction. Now, moving to CapEx, as you can see from the graph, the industry was moving towards downward capital intensity convergence in around the 2017 to 2020 timeframe. Year to date in 2021, we're starting to see an uptick in capital intensity, particularly at BC and TELUS, related to their respective two-year accelerated CapEx programs that occur this year in 2021 and next year in 2022. We also note the likelihood of Rogers and Shaw doing the same either together or separately in 2022 is very high. So looking ahead to 2023, we expect the absolute dollars of CapEx to decline materially for BCE and TELUS with capital intensity declining to the mid-teens as absolute dollars of CapEx drops and revenues continue to increase. We think that Rogers and Shaw are likely to spend heavily in 2022 and 2023, either again, together or separately, before capital intensity softens for them in 2024. So a couple takeaways from this. First, in the 2023 to 2024 period, depending on the company, we'd expect the absolute dollars of CapEx to decline in addition to a decline in CI, 
across the industry. Number two, we don't anticipate a future 5G CapEx spike, which is for free cash flow generation. And three, a significant amount of CapEx spend is on the fiber optic network backbone, which reduces network operating costs, decreases physical plant expenses, and improves network reliability, all of which preside, provide a margin tailwind for the industry. Now, moving on to the regulatory environment, after a prolonged period of uncertainty, 2021 has generally been positive on the regulatory front for the telcos. The industry gained clarity on the <clears throat> CRTC wireless sector review decision, allowing for limited MVNOs, and third-party internet access rates returned to the 2016 period, both of which were good news for incumbents. Future 5G auctions are set right now for early 2023 and also in 2024, and we're optimistic that the ISED will be able to maintain that schedule. Uh, the Huawei decision may actually be coming to a conclusion as Parliament returned yesterday. Um, comments made by Industry Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne in early November suggest that the government ban on Huawei from critical parts of the 5G network infrastructure um, you know, may be coming um, in this current sitting and before year-end. We don't believe that a decision against banning or a decision to ban Huawei from certain parts of the network will be unmanageable for the telcos, as they have all identified major partnerships over the last 18 months, essentially with Ericsson or Nokia. Uh, there's also the 25% pricing reduction on two, four, and six gigabyte BYOD plans for the incumbents, but we think these are manageable. As of September 2021, the most recent data available, we'd note that Two gigabyte plans are down 10%, four gigabyte plans are down 18%, and six gigabyte plans are already down 25% and have already made the threshold. So we would expect compliance by February 2022 by the incumbents. So the bottom line is, at this juncture, we believe there's stability in the wireless outlook over our forecast period. So moving along to special considerations, first, the proposed merger of Rogers and Shaw. Now, we view both companies as highly motivated to complete the proposed merger, but further, we think the proposed transaction also makes strategic sense, particularly on the wireline side. Although there is overlap on the wireless side, we can envision strong business risk associated ratings, i.e. BRAs, as we refer to them, um, within a combined entity. And what we are looking for those business risk assessments are operating factors such as the national wireless footprint, uh, the wireline network coverage, technological compatibility, subscriber base, and what will ultimately be the spectrum portfolio. Being a friendly merger could also potentially be a meaningful factor. We would anticipate the integration plan to be very detailed and thorough, i.e. no surprises. While the initial parameters of the proposed mergers were outlined on March 15th earlier this year, when the merger was first announced, I would caution that many factors remain uncertain, and that may have a bearing on the credit outcome, such as the final portfolio of assets, which could include forced or planned divestitures, the treatment of set-aside spectrum owned by Shaw, deal financing, sources of synergies, the integration and operating plan, and the delevering profile. So if the merger is completed, Rogers, in our view, should be able to finance the transaction in a manner that maintains an IG rating. However, where the rating ultimately falls will mostly depend not necessarily on where the leverage begins per se, but the final delevering profile, the asset portfolio, the operational assumptions that go along with the sort of go-forward strategy, uh, potential use of credit-friendly levers, and quite simply management's ability to execute on the plan. The other special consideration is the recent turmoil uh, within the Rogers board. While the board's recent disagreement on its membership status came to a relatively clean conclusion, it's fair to question whether or not there may be any longer-term implications to the credit profile of the company, especially as the new board, as it's now constituted, must navigate the proposed merger with Shaw and also appoint a new full-time CEO. So to be clear, 
GBRS Morningstar credit analysis does incorporate evaluation of ESG factors. And of course, in this case, we're focused on the G or the governance factor. Now, to be clear, there are some cases where governance factors by themselves can influence ratings, such as illegal activity, bribery, corruption, audit, financial issues. Clearly, that is not the case with Rogers. So, however, while lively board discussions are part of good governance, credit ratings can be influenced, and typically negatively, when one, resources are not effectively or efficiently used to manage the business, two, where there is misalignment of strategy and or vision, or three, where there is a leadership uncertainty and or perceived incapability, which can materially impact the degree or confidence in achieving a corporate goal. So now there's a couple things to take away here. The first one is nothing in the corpor- in the company's voting or governance structure has actually changed over the last two months. Two, the appointment of Tony Staffieri as the interim CEO going into the CRTC's public hearing yesterday, I think actually reduced the uncertainty uh, that the company faces, as many observers were waiting for the other shoe to drop on Jonah Talley. And number three, Tony Staffieri as the interim CEO is also very well positioned to ultimately get the job, especially by all accounts as he was Edward Rogers' top choice. So the bottom line here is with the governance and executive management issues now seemingly stabilized, from a credit perspective, the focus would be on convincing analysts that the company has an basically an airtight execution plan and an executive team that can deliver on it. So in conclusion, what does this mean for our ratings? So while we don't see a sector ground downgrade, we do note that given the capital intensive industry, the shareholder return expectations, the current leverage levels, an upgrade is unlikely. You know, having said that, we believe that the telcos have the financial flexibility to manage their current credit profile in a manner that balances optimal capital structure, shareholder returns, network investment, and long-term earnings growth. Now, if we turn to the individual credit ratings, starting with Bell, Bell is well-positioned in the triple B high rating category at a stable trend. The company started 2021 with leverage at 2.84 and looks to be on track to deliver a solid mid-single-digit EBITDA growth in 2021. Coming into the year, we'd note that Bell had leverage capacity to digest the higher than expected 3,500 megahertz auction costs. So if Rogers and Shaw do complete their merger, we don't anticipate rating pressure for Bell over our forecast horizon. Given Bell's heavy network investment, including the 5G rollout and FTTP or uh, fiber to the premises expansion, we think Bell is well positioned to continue to compete with a potentially combined Rogers and Shaw and which will be working to integrate and execute on a new go-to-market strategy, both which will carry uncertainties. On Rogers and Shaw, the resolution of the under-review for each company will reflect the outcome of the proposed merger, which is expected in the first half of 2022. And as we've just discussed, the final rating will be determined by numerous operational and financial factors, which currently remain uncertain. Moving to TELUS, as we noted at the start of the webinar, TELUS is rated triple B high, but was put on negative trend in August. The negative trend action reflected TELUS's elevated leverage at the end of 2020 at about 3.7 times at gross basis, um, owing to the $1.2 billion Linebridge AI acquisition, which left little leverage cushion for the higher than expected 3,500 megahertz auction and thus impacted the pace of delevering. Having said that, we expect TELUS to deliver industry-leading EBITDA growth in 2021 through the 2023 period, which should drive material delivering over this time frame. So while there is little room for operational miss in order to deliver towards about a three times by 2023, by hitting their own growth targets, the company would support returning to a stable trend. I'd also note that on the third quarter conference call specifically, management indicated that they are committed to delevering using multiple levers, including divestiture of real estate and other non-core assets. And again, here, that would just, in our minds, further support moving to a stable trend. And finally, Kojiko. Kojiko is a very solid double B high rated company. 
I would note the absence of wireless offering has kept Kojiko in the double B overall category, despite being a very solid suburban and rural operator in Ontario and Quebec, with EBITDA margins in the high 40% range. Given the company's 3,500 megahertz spectrum acquisition and the CRTC's limited MVNO wireless ruling, we expect Kojiko could launch a wireless service in 2022. Now, while diversifying into the attractive Canadian mobile market could ultimately be a credit, credit positive event, the offset is that the network investment required would likely pressure near-term or possibly even medium-term cash flow metrics and margins as it looks to establish a mobile presence. Now that concludes our webinar for this afternoon. Of course, feel free to follow up with us at any point in time. And I'm now going to turn it over to Vikas for the Q&A. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so we have received a few questions during the presentation. And before I go through that list, just a quick reminder to the audience that you may please submit additional questions under the Ask a Question tab uh, anytime now. Uh, the first question for you, Scott, is what is the likelihood of a new fourth national wireless career and how does it impact the competitive landscape? Um, yeah, no, that's uh, absolutely. So, you know, I think if the proposed Rogers and Shaw deal is approved, I think there's a very strong likelihood that a new national fourth carrier will emerge. Um, Quebecers Videotron division is the most obvious candidate given its recent 3,500 megahertz uh, spectrum purchase activity. Um, now, there's also speculation that uh, <clears throat> that Rogers um, may not want to sort of sell its, or, or if, if, if the transaction goes through, um, there's a consideration that uh, if required to sell assets, to get the deal done, uh, which I think is highly probable, that um, Rogers would not want to sell those assets to Videotron. Um, I think in that regard, I think the, the main thing is that, in my view, Rogers' motivation to complete the Shaw acquisition would outweigh its reluctance to deal with Videotron you know, as a potential buyer of any wireless assets that need to be divested. However, having said that, I think regardless of the operator, I think the incumbents such as Bell and TELUS are still very well positioned to compete in what would essentially be a very similar competitive landscape. So Bell and TELUS, you know, and, and that's mainly or in large part due to the fact that Bell and TELUS have opportunistically, you know, ramped up their network investment by about a billion dollars each over the two year period you know, really to sort of drive 5G and fiber to the home expansion, and that does set them up very well to compete. Uh, great. Thanks, Scott. Uh, there are a couple of questions uh, related to the last Spectrum auction, which I, I think was a little bit higher than what uh, the industry was expecting and uh, the accelerated uh, CapEx program. So what are your expectations for for spectrum allocation cost going forward? Um, yeah, so the short answer is that we have essentially doubled our prior cost estimates for 3,800 in millimeter wave spectrum auctions. Uh, the 3,800 has gone from roughly three to three and a half billion to a roughly six to six and a half billion. And at the moment, we're, we've got millimeter wave. Uh, we previously had it at about two to two and a quarter billion, and we've moved that up to about four to four and a quarter billion. Um, now, the revised auction costs are the assumptions we use to drive our leverage and ROC forecasts that were presented earlier uh, in the slides. Um, and I would note a couple things, though, related to 3,800 megahertz auction. Uh, first is that there's expected to be considerably more 3,800 megahertz spectrum made available than there was uh, for the 35, which reduces the scarcity factor. Uh, the incumbents also now hold a fairly sizable amount of mid-band spectrum uh, and are well past the sort of halfway mark in terms of functional spectrum required to provide 5G, which is 
continuous spectrum of about 80 to 100 megahertz in the C-band. And finally, 3800 megahertz spectrum also isn't anticipated to be available until 2025. Uh, so there's not a lot of near term, there, you know, there's not like a near term rollout race in the market, uh, the same way that we had with 3500 becoming available and people racing to to be able to capitalize on it. Okay, uh, thank God. Uh, another um, area that a lot of viewers are interested in is is, is the regulatory issues, uh, and you did touch upon that uh, in one of your slides. Uh, the question that I have for you is: Are there any future regulatory issues that could negatively impact the industry? Um, yeah, as as we noted, the regulatory environment improved in 2021. You know, on several fronts. Um, and at this juncture, uh, the main regulatory issue is the Roger and Shaw review, which we think there should be clarity on in the first half of 2022. Um, you know, have a, however, having said that, we note that the currently mandated 25% price reduction on two, four, and six gigabit BYOD plans for the incumbent ends in February of 2022. Uh, you know, there's always a possibility that a new pricing mandate of some sort is introduced. And that would be, you know, kind of like a, mere, a near-term regulatory issue that we would sort of uh, be on the lookout for. Okay. Um, and you, you were pretty clear on the factors that are driving the wireless uh, net subscribers. Um, but could you also share your thoughts on the outlook for the wireline subscribers? Yeah, on... On the plus side, when it comes to the wireline subscribers, um, we would see continued positive trends on the ads for things like high-speed internet, the IPTV, and home security. Um, you know, being made available by higher network speeds, the increased size of the data package, and really, you know, continued expansion of fiber to the to the premise footprint in homes and businesses. You know, and additional customer and enterprise services being added over time. You know, the offset is that the continued decline in telephony and satellite services. So the net overall would be um, net ads uh, sort of up, sort of flat to modestly positive on a quarter over, you know, on quarter to quarter type basis, recognizing there is typically seasonality. Um, but the one thing when it comes to the wireline side is when we look at the wireline business, our main focus there is basically EBITDA performance where we anticipate sort of low single digit growth and margin maintenance, you know, again, supported by that improving OPEX trend, which is, as I said, related to the sort of robustness and the lower operating costs to uh, to operate a fiber optic network than, uh, than you know, the, the traditional copper networks that they are finally being replaced with. Okay. Um, Scott, we have... Uh a couple of questions related to Rogers and Shaw uh, deal. Uh, you addressed that in the special cases, even about the Rogers board management. Uh, I'll, I'll just sum these questions together uh, because you've already answered uh, part of it, even the first question earlier uh, that I asked about the fourth national career. Uh, the bottom line that I, I think people still want to know would be, what happens to the ratings of Rogers and Shaw if the merger is not completed? Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So I think if that the proposed merger falls apart, uh, we do think that there could be rating pressure on one or both Rogers and Shaw, which could affect either the rating and or the trend. Um, on Rogers, the positive would be the absence of a spike in leverage, obviously, um, the absence of incremental debt, uh, and the integration period. However, on the negative side, there will be an updated board and a new executive management team you know, that's going to need to articulate a clear strategic direction, and one that's presumably different from what was under Jonatale, and that may create uncertainty in both the direction but also the execution. Uh, on the Shaw side, uh, the most obvious issue would be the company's lack of 3,500 megahertz spectrum. 
and the prospect that additional C-band spectrum won't be available until 2025. Um, and so similar to Rogers, we'd expect a revised strategy and execution plan on why being independent is actually better in the end. So the bottom line would be rating pressures on both companies if the proposed merger isn't approved uh, could certainly be, um, you know, at one outcome for sure. Okay. Uh, thank you, Scott. I, I think we have covered uh, most of the questions that were asked. So thank, thanks a lot for that. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, just a reminder, the replay for this event would be available after we conclude today. And if you'd like to have a copy of the presentation, please uh, feel free to reach out to our events team at events at dbrsmorningstar.com. Thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Have a great day.